Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service here at Northwest Bear United Church. It is Sunday, January the 30th, 2022. And uh, I think last week I said welcome at the end of a long and cold and snowy January week. Well, same thing this week. Welcome to the end of a long and cold and snowy January week. But um, February's around the corner, so we are slowly but surely getting there. As always, I like to start by sharing any celebrations going on in the life of our church. And uh, just one today, and I am going to break my own rule. My rule is I don't announce birthdays unless people tell me to announce them. Um, but uh, this person didn't tell me to share her birthday, but I'm going to anyway. Um, Catherine DeLonardo, who of course is our office administrator, she is celebrating her birthday on Monday. So a very happy birthday to Catherine. And if you are celebrating out there this uh, weekend or this week, we wish you well uh, as well. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, for those in Ontario, Ontario, you know that we are, uh, our restrictions are being loosened uh, in the province this coming week, allowing more things to open, which means that we're going to begin over the next few days and weeks to begin to open our uh, church here as well. Um, but in terms of Sunday uh, services, we're going to remain closed until February the 20th, and uh, then we hope to reopen to in-person worship. So two more weeks of online, and then hopefully we'll be back uh, here again, and I'll, I'll let everybody know through Northwest News. Uh, secondly, uh, just a reminder that next Sunday, that's February the 6th, we have our annual meeting. That's going to take place at 1 o'clock after the church service. It's going to be done uh, via, via Zoom online. And as I mentioned last week, uh, we need you to sign up if you want to attend. I put the sign-up link in Northwest News, so you can sign up that way. Uh, if you don't get Northwest News and you'd like to come out uh, for that, it takes about an hour or so, 1 to 2, it's open to members and adherents. Uh, please call the church office and we'll put you on the list. And then we'll send everybody the, the Zoom link a little closer to the time. And just a note to board members who I know you'll be attending, uh, you also need to sign up. So please don't just uh, come out. We need you to sign up ahead of time as well. And again, you can do that through Northwest News. Final announcement is that we had hoped that we were going to have a, a Euchre night. Uh, in the winter months, so January, February. Um, but of course, given the fact that we've been closed, we are going to postpone that. It is going to happen, but it's going to happen probably more likely in March. So watch for details. And uh, I know it's a, it's a fan favorite around here. So that's all I've got for you now. Why don't we begin our service with our call to worship? Life is about choices. We have chosen today to set aside an hour of our day and our week to be present here to join virtually with others for the gift of worship. May the choice that we've made today prove to be a good choice. May the music and message of this time strengthen us, inspire us, guide us, fulfill us as we prepare for all that life has in store for us this week. Come, let us open our hearts to the gift of worship. Our opening hymn is Each Blade of Grass. Please join me now in our opening prayer. 
And let us pray. Gracious God, as we take a quiet moment in prayer, let's think back over the week that was. Maybe the week unfolded according to plan, and maybe this week surprised us in unexpected ways. We may find ourselves at the end of this week glad or relieved that it's over, or we may find ourselves grateful for what it brought to our lives. We bring it all to worship today, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Remind us today that we always have a choice in life, to bring to each moment faith that is stronger than fear, hope that is stronger than despair, love that is stronger than indifference, and life that is stronger than loss. Speak to us today a soothing, comforting, gentle presence that holds us always. Amen. I know a favorite hymn for many, many people, myself included, is Amazing Grace. Uh, Man is going to sing that for us today, but she has a, a new version of Amazing Grace. So uh, I'm excited to, to hear what it's all about, and uh, I hope you are too. Thank you to Amanda. Again, this is always the time in the service when we take up the, uh, we would take up the offering here in church. And once again, um, cannot say thank you enough uh, for all the support that continues, uh, all the ways that you, you keep our church uh, alive and thriving in these times. So thank you for your gifts. Listen now for these words of dedication. Where money is given joyfully, where time and talents are offered freely, where the hurt of the world is taken seriously, where the church responds caringly, we believe your blessing will be received, O oh God. Accept these gifts we bring, use them, and use us in love. Amen. 
two uh, short passages uh, for the Bible reading today. The first is way back in the Old Testament, back in the book of Deuteronomy, and it is chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your offspring may live with abundance, loving God and holding fast to God. For that means life to you and length of days. And now way on the other side of the Bible in the New Testament in the, um, the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for God is near. Do not worry about anything, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think on these things and keep on doing the things that you have learned. Amen. This morning, I'm continuing with the series called Liar, Liar, as we look at uh, some of the lies that we tell ourselves. So the lie I want to look at today goes something like this. I had no choice. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. Those of you who follow politics know that it's very rare in an election that a debate between two leaders really changes anything in the polls. Usually the candidate leading before the debate is the same candidate that's leading after the debate. But then every so often, a debate can change everything. Do you remember 1984? Brian Mulroney and John Turner took part in one of the most famous debates in Canadian history. Let me just back up for a moment. A few months before this debate, uh, Pierre Trudeau left office as prime minister, leaving uh, John Turner as the prime minister. And just before Trudeau left office, he made a number of Patriots appointments, which Turner felt obliged to follow up on. Well, Mulroney smelled blood. In the debate, he called out John Turner for not stopping Trudeau's Patriots appointments, to which Turner replied, but I had no choice. And Mulroney went right for the jugular. You had an option, sir. You could have said no, but what you did was not good for Canadians. John Turner continued to insist that he had no choice, but the damage was done. And most people believe that was the moment that Brian Mulroney and the progressive conservatives won that election. He went on to win a huge majority and then went on to make more patronage appointments himself than any prime minister in history. Now, of course, the irony is that Turner was basically right. He really didn't have much of a choice. And that's not a political statement because I actually supported Brian Mulroney back in the day. But if you look at the situation, if Turner had wanted to reverse those Patriots appointments, he would have had to have gone to the Governor General, something that's never been done in Canadian history. And Mulroney knew that. But it didn't matter. Because Mulroney also knew that by appealing to the notion that we always have a choice, he would appeal to something empowering in Canadians who often feel at the mercy of the choices of their political leaders. You had an option, sir. This morning I want to look at the topic of choices in the context of the lies that we tell ourselves. Because sometimes a whopper of a lie can be I didn't have a choice. Because as we know, the freedom to choose is one of the greatest freedoms that we all enjoy, particularly in free societies. This service, for example, will go over much better here in Barrie than it would in Pyongyang in North Korea. 
We are lucky to live in a place where freedom of choice is, for the most part, an enshrined right. And we value it. But that's not to say that the freedom of choice is something that we can always exercise. Because we're all limited by our circumstances. For example, we can choose who we put into power in this country, but we can't choose what they do with that power. We can choose to eat well and exercise, but that doesn't mean that our bodies aren't going to turn on us at some point. We can choose a career path that we love, but we can't choose those that share that office space with us. So of course the ability to choose is always limited by the circumstances we find ourselves in. It's like the story of the guy who takes a flight on a discount airline. The flight attendant comes around and says to the guy, would you like dinner? The guy says, sure, what are my choices? She looks at him without smiling and she says, yes or no. So whenever I do a sermon on choice, it always comes with that caveat that we all are at the mercy of some things beyond our control in life. Who among us back in March 2020 said, boy, I really love to go through a pandemic. Nobody made that choice. It was made for us. But in many ways, that's what makes the freedom of choice that much more sacred. Because the ultimate choice that we make in life is the choice in how we deal with the things that are beyond our control. We can always choose our attitude. We can always choose our response. We can always choose what lessons we learn from something. How many people remember back in the 80s, there was a, a pop group called Wham, um, starring George Michael and the other guy, I can't remember his name. And they had a hit song called Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go. And if you ever saw the video, uh, George Michael, the singer, had a shirt on that said, choose life. Uh, and uh, for a while, I remember everybody was wearing those shirts that said, choose life. You might be interested to know that he actually didn't come up with that phrase. That is actually a biblical phrase. Listen again to what it says in the book of Deuteronomy. I call heaven and earth to witness to you today. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Here we go. Choose life, that you and your offspring may live with abundance. Choose life. That is the ultimate choice that we have. So why don't we? So why do we let ourselves sometimes fall victim to the idea that we are at the mercy of life rather than its master? That we are the unmoored ship caught in the storms that push us this way and that way, and, and all we can do is hold up our hands and say, I have no choice. Rather than choosing life, more often or sometimes we feel victimized by life. And that certainly speaks to our situation today. Again, we've had two years in which, let's face it, our freedom of choice has been greatly curtailed. Never. Did any of us foresee a day in this country when we could be told where we could or couldn't go? Where we could be told where we could stand and, and not stand? Or what we had to do to enjoy the, the few freedoms that were left? You know, I'm planning this service on Thursday, or I'm speaking on Thursday, but of course you're hearing it on Sunday, but I know back on Thursday, you know, everything in the news is about all the trucks that are descending on Parliament Hill. I'm, I'm assuming they're probably there or have been there as you're listening to this on Sunday. But again, that was a convoy about freedom of choice. Uh, people saying that, um, that we should be allowed uh, to choose how we respond to this pandemic. Choose life is a great slogan for a t-shirt, but it's been a difficult one to swallow lately. And yet, and yet, bubbling up from scripture is this challenge. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that you may live with abundance. So my topic this morning is, how can we still choose life at a time 
when life may not be giving us what we wish it would. I want to share with you a few thoughts, but rather than coming from me, I want to lean on the wisdom of a man who wrote perhaps the most inspiring words when faced with a situation unimaginable for the majority of us. The man's name is Viktor Frankl. Many of you know his story. Many of you probably don't know his story. Frankl was born in Austria. Uh, he was born into a Jewish family. In 1930, he graduated from medical school and he went into the field of psychiatry. In 1940, he got a job as the head of neurology at Rothschild Hospital in Vienna. In 1942, just days after he and his wife were married, he was rounded up with other, other prominent Austrian Jews and sent to the concentration camps. He would spend the next three years in four different concentration camps, including Auschwitz. He lost pretty much all of his family, but he managed to survive. And after that experience, he wrote, well, he wrote many books, but perhaps his most famous was a book called Man's Search for Meaning. A book that is almost like a Bible for anyone who's found themselves trying to cope with life's harshest moments or its cruelest barbs. The book is based on one single idea. You always have a choice. So I want to share with you five little sound bites from this book. Five nuggets of wisdom that perhaps you can carry with you into what I, I hope are the waning days and weeks of COVID. Maybe to inspire you in those moments when you say to yourself, I have no choice. So here we go. I'm going to put each one up on the screen so you can, uh, you can read along. Number one, the first nugget of wisdom that Viktor Frankl wrote. Everything can be taken from a person but one thing. The last of human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Dr. Carl Menninger used to say that attitudes are more important than aptitudes. And we certainly have enough anecdotal evidence to know that that is true. A good attitude always serves us well. I think we've all been inspired during these pandemic times by those who seem to remain positive and hopeful and cheerful. You know, when Frankl was in the concentration camps, he noticed that those who succumbed to their situation were those, he said, gave in to despair. He said, when people gave in to despair, they turned inwards. They became, as he put it, lost to themselves. They would isolate themselves. They would turn others away. They were ultimately destroyed by their own inner pain. So Franco made a conscious decision that he would try to act in the camps the way he did in his regular life, including sharing whatever he had, showing compassion to others, even laughing when there was little or nothing to laugh about. He credited that practice with keeping a tough mental attitude that saw him through those difficult times. Our attitude is everything. I remember going to a seminar years ago and uh, the woman giving the seminar held up a white piece of paper. And on the white piece of paper, there was a tiny black dot. And she held it up and she said to us, what do you see? And every single one of us, to a person, every one of us said a black dot. And she said, isn't it interesting? You all said you saw a black dot. None of you said you saw a white piece of paper. I'll never forget that. You know, it's human nature to hone in on the black dot, but miss all the other stuff going on around it, all the other stuff that could give that black dot perspective. A good attitude helps to keep us looking at the white paper. Or I've always liked the story of the shoe company who sent two salesmen to two uh, uh, developing places in Africa. 
And after a month, the, tele the uh, company got a telegram from the first salesman, and, and it said, it's terrible here. No one wears shoes. There's no opportunities. I'm coming home. The next day, they got the following telegram from the other salesman. It's great here. No one wears shoes. There's lots of opportunity. I'm staying. A good attitude is the greatest choice we can make. It keeps us focused on the white paper. Everything can be taken from us, but the ability to choose one's attitude. Number two, here's the second nugget of wisdom from this remarkable book. Those who have a why to live by can bear almost any how. That's a great quote. We all need a why in life. Something to get us out of bed in the morning. Something to focus our actions and get our feet moving. And stimulate our brains. Move us forward. Do you know what Viktor Frankl's why was? He was determined that what he experienced in the camps would make him a better, more compassionate doctor if he went on to survive. In other words, he made the concentration camp kind of like his classroom. He saw everything as having the ability to deepen his understanding of life and human nature. What is your why in life? Maybe your why is to be the best parent, the best grandparent, the best partner or friend that you can be. Maybe your why is to succeed at your job. Or maybe it's something more subtle than that. Maybe your why is simply to find a way to help somebody every day, ease another's suffering, put a smile on your face, or maybe just make your corner of the world a little kinder and gentler. Here's the cool thing in life. We get to pick our whys. It's one of life's greatest choices. We get to decide what purpose our life is going to have. And when we have it, and when we stick to it, we won't let things like hows and whats and whos take that control away from us. I think those who have fared the best in this pandemic are those who've never lost sight of their why. They found a way to live their purpose despite the chaos around them. You know, the old Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius once said, we all need to be the rock that breaks all the waves that crash against it. Having a why in life provides that solid ground when the waves crash in. Those who have a why to live by can bear almost any how. Number three, his third piece of wisdom. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Viktor Frankl realized when he was in Auschwitz that Auschwitz was not going to adapt to him. He was going to have to adapt to it. And he did. He made that choice. As I keep saying, the reality in life is we don't always have a choice. Sometimes we are at the mercy of things that are beyond our control. And try as we might to change them, we run up against them like a brick wall. The key phrase then come, becomes not what do we choose, but how do we adapt? Sometimes the best choice we have is the choice to adapt to a new situation or reality. I was re reading recently about the invention of roses. And I know what you're thinking. Well, roses were invented. They were invented by Mother Nature or God or whomever. Well, in a way, they actually were invented. During the Middle Ages, roses would grow in the fields of Europe, and they were beautiful, but they would only bloom for a very few days, making them not a particularly practical flower. It wasn't until the 18th century that botanists came up with an idea. They noticed that in China, wild roses also grew, and the flowers that, from a wild rose was actually a sickly green color, not beautiful at all, but the difference was they had longevity. When they bloomed, they were bloomed for the entire summer. So they grafted the wild rose 
onto the European rose. And voila, we have the modern day rose in all of its beautiful color and longevity. Sometimes to bloom in difficult times, we make the choice to adapt. And sometimes we adapt by drawing from the wisdom of others. You know, maybe we are that, that flower that blooms for a little while and then uh, deflates again. So maybe we seek somebody out who has that, that longevity of hope, who can help us to move beyond those blooming times. It's a way when we adapt to find new colors and new expressions of ourselves. I've shared these words before quite a few times, actually, but I do really like them. In Westminster Abbey, below the floor, there are the crypts. There's a tomb uh, in the crypts of an Anglican bishop who died back in 1100 AD. And on the stone beneath the tomb are carved some words. These are the words that are carved there. And I'm going to put them up on the screen so, so you can read them too. When I was young and free, my imagination had no limits. I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sight somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years, in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing my, only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now, as I lie on my deathbed, I suddenly realize, if I had only changed myself first, then by example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would have been able to better my country, and who knows? I may even have changed the world. When you can't change your situation, the choices, the challenges to change ourselves. Number four, and I'm actually not going to say anything about this because really this point is an entirely different sermon in and of itself. But I want to put it up here because it's a very interesting uh, insightful piece of wisdom. This is what Viktor Frankl wrote. Suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds its meaning. I'm just going to let that one out there and I'm going to let you do the heavy lifting on this one and, and think about what that passage may mean to you. Suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds its meaning. And finally, number five, Frankel wrote this. For the world is in a bad state, but everything can get better so long as each of us does our best. I've never loved the expression at the end of the day, but I'm going to use it because it fits. At the end of the day, really, isn't the decision to choose life really just the decision to do our best? Yesterday, I switched on the news, and the first story was about the relentless spread of Omicron. The next story was about the situation in the Ukraine. The next story was about rising uh, inflation and problems with the supply chain for food, and ah, I ended up turning off the TV. I couldn't take it anymore. It really can feel like we are the victims of life rather than its master. It's so easy to give in to despair. But then I think about a life lived like Viktor Frankl. With all the odds stacked against him, he refused to lose hope. He refused to lose faith. He refused to let the darkness around him become the darkness within him. He chose to survive. He chose to make the best of what life had given to him. He chose to do his best, knowing that in the end, his best was good enough. You know, when I was watching all those awful stories on the news, I got to think about, again, that image of the black dot on the white page. I don't know about you, I'd be looking at that black dot far too often these days. 
So let's look at the white page. When we look on the white page, we discover stories like this. On January 12th, Dr. Aisha Khatib had settled back into her seat to enjoy her flight from Qatar to Uganda. The pilot had just announced that they were flying over the ancient Nile River in Egypt. Aisha closed her eyes to rest. The next thing she heard was an announcement over the loudspeaker asking for a doctor as there was a medical emergency on board. Aisha was a doctor from the University of Toronto. So she leapt to her feet to see if she could help. The flight attendant rushed her to the back of the plane where there was a woman in the midst of giving birth to a baby. The woman was a migrant worker returning home to Uganda. She'd started feeling abdominal cramps and before she knew it, she had started to give birth. Dr. Aisha rushed to her side. With the help of a nurse on board, delivered the baby. When the baby was born, Dr. Aisha proclaimed, it's a girl. And the passengers erupted into cheers and applause. That mother was so grateful, she named the baby Miracle Aisha in honor of the doctor who delivered her and in honor of the miracle of birth that took place thousands of feet above the ancient Nile River. The moral of that story is, at least for me, that life always finds a way. While we stare at the black dot wringing our hands, there's all kinds of good stuff going on in the white paper. Babies are born. Friendships are built and sustained. Gifts are shared. Birthdays are celebrated. Couples get married. Phone calls are made. Lives are remembered and honored. Good things continue to happen. Good things. Enough to keep the spark of hope and faith alive even in these challenging times. Why should we choose life? Because life has a habit of always finding its way. 30,000 feet in the air, in modern day roses that bloom in the fields of Europe, in the dark crypts of Westminster Abbey, life is there teaching us, leading us, whispering to us, don't give up, but keep doing your best. Keep a positive attitude and be a partner with God in birthing what is good into the world. Everything can be taken from a person but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given circumstances, to choose one's way. Here's my challenge and my invitation to you heading into this week. If you've been staring at that black dot, take your eyes off it for a moment. See what you can see on the page that is around it. You might discover there's more good in the world than you ever thought. Amen. Just before um, I share a final prayer, uh, as I mentioned in the message, uh, I, of course, taped this service on Thursday and then you watch it on Sunday. So I never know what happens in the world between then and, and, uh, and, and now. But certainly, I know this week, uh, I've been watching a lot of what's been happening in, uh, in the Ukraine. And uh, certainly, I know a lot of my prayers have been for, for peace. And I'm sure a lot of your prayers have been for peace there as well. Not just for those two countries, but for, for all the, the other nations involved as well. I know they're unstable times, so I think all of our prayers today are with all places in the world that, uh, that are struggling. So let us pray. God, we thank you for the gift of worship and the opportunity to be here together, even though separated, to hear the same words, to share the same music, most importantly, to share the faith that we all have in common. 
For it is a faith that invites us to make choices. And every day we do have that ability. Even in circumstances where choices are being made for us, we always get to choose our attitude, our response, and the lessons that we learn. As we go into this week, we will be called upon to make choices every day. May we make those choices with wisdom, with insight, and most especially with the goals of love and justice towards one another and towards ourselves. And help each one of us in these days to stop focusing on the black dot and to focus on the white paper, all the many good, wonderful, caring things that are going on all around us. May those things sustain us, may they give us hope, and may they continue to sustain our faith in whatever the days ahead may bring. We pray for each other, we pray for our world. And we pray now for the many things that we bring to this service today. As we take a quiet moment, help us to go deeply into ourselves, to think about the people that we are thinking about today, the people that we wish to pray for today, including ourselves. So hear now our own prayers. God, hear our prayers. May you bless and keep and hold each one of us in these days ahead. And hear us now as we continue in prayer as we share the words of the Lord's Prayer. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, for our service today. We made it almost to the end of January, so the next time I see you, it'll be February and that much closer to springtime. The words of benediction I'd like to put up on the screen so you can read along with me. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other. Our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true. Amen.